dear sisters and brothers in Christ. May the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost reassure you each day of God's presence with you now and always. May the Spirit fill you with God's grace, mercy, and his peace. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for sending us your Holy Spirit. Your Holy Spirit to always lead us, to guide us, to direct us. That we might seek after you, that we might know you, that we might be made holy through you. Lord, we pray that as we come to you this day, that you would always guide us, that you would always give us hope and comfort. May you know, may we know that you are the hero who has brought us salvation. This we pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. You know, and it is the season of the year where there are a lot of graduations and placements and there are confirmations as we're celebrating today or even promotions. People will, children, uh, students will be graduating from kindergarten, from eighth grade. They'll be promoted on to high school. There are students who are graduating high school who are getting ready to go off to college for their first time. They're graduates from college, scared to death about the job market, looking forward to their first job. And when you think about it, there's going to be lots of different speeches that are given. You're going to have, hear speeches from the learned and the, the wise, and they're going to talk about all those things that these young minds will accomplish in their lives. They will shape their speeches to give instruction, direction, but point backwards as well, reminding these students of what has happened in the past, the way, what's brought them to this point. And some of these speeches will include references to our heroes, to the heroes that these students have had through the years, to those who they looked up to, to those who they respected, to those who shaped and formed, influenced them. Well, today, lest we go too fast, too far, we're talking, confirmation is not graduation. Confirmation is not to celebrate being done with two years of classes. Sorry, Wyatt. Confirmation is not even just a recognition of what we have done, but confirmation is a time where we remember what happened, well, several years ago for you, Wyatt. We remember that Wyatt, we remember each of us, that we were baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what confirmation is, is it's a time to remember that. It's a time to remember that God has chosen us, that he has chosen us to be his people, that he has chosen us to be those who share his word, who proclaim his gospel, who share his love. We're reminded that he has chosen us to be his, not here only on this earth, but in eternity as well. And as we think about that, as we think about the fact that God has chosen us, we're drawn for a moment back to our reading from this morning, from Joshua, and we're reminded of the people that God chose along the way. God chose many people, and we now consider them heroes of faith. But if you look back at their lives, you realize that God did not pick heroes. He made heroes. Think about it for just a moment. We have Moses. Moses was a stutterer. He probably had a speech impediment. He didn't want to speak, and God used him to lead his people out of Egypt into, well, to the edge of the promised land. He wasn't perfect. He used Rahab, a prostitute, the lowest of the low in society, to provide for the people of Israel a place of refuge, a red cord in her window. He used Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Maybe if you don't remember those names, this is fast forward in history, but these three gentlemen, they were in Babylon. They were asked to bow down to King Nebuchadnezzar to bow down, and they chose not to. This part that you probably most people remember. They were thrown into a fiery furnace. The Bible says the fire was so hot that the guy who was lighting it actually burned up. But they did not. And God used them to, sh to demonstrate their, his faith, the promise. We have Mary in the New Testament, a teenage girl, pregnant, scared to death. God uses her to bring salvation into the world through his son Jesus. And how about Paul? Another imperfect hero of the faith, isn't he? Another imperfect hero who 
at first breathed out venomous, murderous threats against God's people. And God used him anyway to proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth. Hopefully you're seeing a pattern here. Because the list could go on and on, couldn't it? Because when we think about who God uses, we realize that God uses common, everyday, normal people. People just like us. To be his heroes of the faith. And I need to make sure you hear this. God does not pick heroes. He makes heroes. He makes heroes out of us. He makes heroes out of his people. And he makes heroes by our faith and trust in him. Now we had a reading from Joshua, as I'd mentioned. And if you look at Joshua, you'll notice that, and I encourage you, go back to chapter 1 and read this on your, on your own when you get home. Four times. Four times, although we only read it once this morning, but be strong and courageous. Four times, be strong and courageous. God makes that point. Joshua was probably scared to death. He had huge shoes to fill in Moses. He was probably scared to death. The people, he had heard the, their, their gossiping and their backbiting and the way that they treated their previous leaders, and he probably didn't want nothing to do with that. But God encouraged him, said, be strong and courageous. In fact, let's read the rest of that reading once, once again here. This is Joshua 1, verse 9. <clears throat> Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. God gave to Joshua that promise, that hero of the faith. God gives to us that same promise today. He gives us that very same promise that, to be, that if we are strong and courageous, if we trust in him, we need not be afraid. We need not be terrified because he will be with us. He will always be with us. But are we? You know, it's easy to talk about heroes, isn't it? Oftentimes we look back at heroes. We look back at, at the way that they shaped our world, shaped our lives. But to actually be a hero is much harder. It is easier said than done. It's much easier to stand up constantly for what is right. It is much easier to talk about standing up for it than actually standing up for it. It's much easier to talk about the way that we should stay in God's word, that we should praise him on a daily basis than it is to actually do it. It's much easier because being a hero, it is scary. Being a hero can alienate you. Just look at, at the hero, heroes throughout history. Well, God was with them. How many others wanted to follow them? How many close personal relationships did they have? You know, being a hero oftentimes can be alienating as well. But God promises that we are not alone. Still, how often can we, sorry for the cliche here, how often can we talk the talk but not walk the walk? How often can we talk about being Christians but when it comes to standing up, being an example in the world, living as Christians, how often do we? Think about it for just a moment. Because so often it's easy to want to be a good Christian man or a good Christian woman. So often it's easy for us to have that desire in our hearts. As Wyatt comes forward this morning, he, is, he has that full desire in his heart. He's going to go through and he's going to talk about how faithful he will be as each of us and our confirmation did. But we also know it's easier said than done. We also know that, that at times we grow weak and we grow weary. That our own sinfulness gets in the way. We often, often know that sometimes being a hero is just more than we are willing to do. Isn't the status quo more comfortable? More convenient? To just blend in with the rest of the world. To be like the rest of the world. It doesn't make our families angry with us. It doesn't drive off our friends and co-workers. It's comfortable. Psychologists have studied human responses. And one of the responses that they've talked about is what's called the bystander effect. Now, I don't know if any of you have heard of the bystander effect before, also called the Genovese syndrome. Wyatt, I saw you raising your hand. Awesome. 
Uh, but when you, if, even if you've not heard of those, let me explain essentially what those are. The bystander effect is, is when people, usually a crowd, actually the greater the crowd, the, the more they will stand by and watch as an emergency occurs. Instead of stepping in and helping, they will stand by and watch. Now, many of the scholars who have studied this, researchers as they've looked into it, they've said there are different reasons for this. But most scholars come back to the, the same center point, and that is they assume someone else will do it. The reason it's called that we'll step in, we'll help. The reason it's called the Genovese syndrome is there was a young lady in New York in the 1970s. Her name was Kitty Genovese. And in the public day, in daylight in the public street with a crowd all around her, she was stabbed brutally to death several times. And no one, no one stopped to help her. And I thought about this bystander effect. This Genovese syndrome, because I think a lot of Christians are content to have to live that way. We look and we say, well, it is so and so will do it. So and so will share their faith. So and so will stand up for God. I can't always be the one, so let me pass the buck to someone else. And I think far too often, whether or not we intend this in our lives, in our hearts, this is what happens. Instead of being the one who stands up, who is holy, the one who is the hero, we'll let someone else do it. We'll pass the buck to someone else. We'll put that on them. It's part of our sinful nature, isn't it? If we take an honest look at ourselves, it's part of who we are. Thankfully, God, our Father, he was not willing to stand by and just accept the status quo. Thankfully, God, our Heavenly Father, was not willing to just let things happen and let things play out. Because do you know what would happen? All of us would die without knowing Him. Instead, He had a plan. A plan for the salvation of each one of us. A plan that He laid out before the foundations of the world. A plan to save each one of you, to save each one of you as his sons and daughters. He wasn't willing to accept the status quo. He wasn't willing to stand by and watch. So instead, he sent his son Jesus to, into the world to take on our human flesh, to bear our pain and suffering. And as our hero, to take on the sweat, the pain, the tears, to be brutally murdered. But then to rise that we might have life forever. And truly, truly that courage, that promise that Jesus gave to us on the cross is our salvation. It is the hope that we have that one day we will rise with Him. And that is the hope, Wyatt, that you are going to profess today. The hope that it's not about you. It's not about any of you. But it's about what God is doing in you. It's about God who is working in your heart and working in your lives. That from the moment that you were baptized into his name, that he has continued to work in you, and he will continue to do so. In fact, today as we celebrate the Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, we realize that that was not just a one-time event, an event that only it just impacted that short time in history, but the Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, is a daily event in our lives and in our hearts, and it has to be. The coming of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and our lives has to be daily because He is the one who leads us to forgiveness. He is the one who leads us to seek that forgiveness of God in our repentance. Without Him, we would not know God. Did you notice how Luther described it in the, in the third article? I cannot by my own reason or strength, but by the work of the Spirit in each of us. So the Holy Spirit draws us to the Lord. But He also does amazing things in our lives and in our hearts as well. The Holy Spirit is constantly working in us. The Holy Spirit is constantly there leading us not only to God, but leading us to be those people who stand up for God, who speak out for God, who defend God, who live our faith in God. The Holy Spirit is the one who leads us to have that courage, even when we don't feel strong or courageous. He is the one who leads us that we might have the hope and promise that one day we'll be with our Lord and Savior in eternity. 
this is the word that we celebrate today. This is the hope that we proclaim so that all may know that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, I can't give a speech, the pep talk that maybe you'll hear at, a, at your promotion tomorrow, Wyatt. But hopefully as you hear the word of God today, you know that it is not my word, but it is always God's word working in your heart and in your life. And I hope that each of you knows that as well. That it's not the words of the preacher, it's not the words of any preacher, even the words of hymns, but it is God who creates faith in our hearts, it is God who leads us each and every day. It is God who will lead us home. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for the many examples of heroes we have in the faith. Those men and women that you made heroes, uh, those men and women who humbled their hearts and trusted in you. We pray, dear Lord, that you would humble our hearts, that even in the midst of our sinfulness, our fears, our distrust, that we would know you. Send your spirit that he might lead us and guide us. That we might have true hope and true courage. That we might know for certain the full assurance that because of Jesus' suffering and death on the cross that we are saved. Lord, today is, is why it confirms the faith spoken at his baptism. We pray that we too would each day confirm that faith being reassured that God has placed his name upon our hearts. In all things we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.